Hi everyone, welcome to BitGuide, the Open Bitcoin University. This is our first course in the economic series, which is focused on the concept of money, its emergence, historical evolution, and economic role. My name is Sina. I'm a professor of business and a co-founder of BitGuide. You can find me on Twitter at Sina underline BitGuide. BitGuide is an educational and coaching platform for Bitcoin. One of our main educational activities uh, are courses like this one, where we curate and condense the most important pieces of information that a Bitcoin enthusiast needs to know. In this course, we decided to focus on the most fundamental concept in this space, which is money. So a lot of people uh, don't know exactly what money is, and uh, uh, this is something that's uh, uh, a foreign concept to a lot of people, including who, people who are trained as economists. We will start by looking at the simplest possible economy, the economy of a bunch of cavemen. We will see how trade emerges in this economy. We will study why trade is needed and what is the benefit it offers to people. Then we will move on to the concept of barter and why it emerges and its limitations. Um, these limitations would then lead us to, uh, to understand why money is created in a society. Then we will expand that into a discussion of credit and how it is, how it is invented and what is the problem it solves. And lastly, we will talk about, uh, we will sort of summarize all the previous discussions and have a deep dive into features of good money. Uh, what are the, uh, what are the features uh, uh, a well-functioning money needs to have? Uh, we will then talk about money supply, inflation, stock to flow, wealth shift, and all the implications of not having a good money. One of the best ways to understand a new concept is to uh, focus on its emergence and strip away all the complexities that we see in a uh, modern system and instead focus on the simplest possible system that gave birth to that concept. Uh, along the same line, I'm going to focus on caveman economy and see uh, what role money would be playing in that sort of environment. So imagine a group of primitive humans living in caves and their primary concern is to feed themselves and survive. So what they'll be doing is spend the whole day trying to find food and because food is scarce and they don't have advanced tools yet, if they're lucky by the end of the day they would have found just enough food to survive and feed themselves. They have no surplus, as a result there's no need to trade or there's no ability to trade because no one has any accumulated or extra to, ch to exchange with other people. But with humans, things don't remain the same for a long time. As intelligent species, we learn as we do things. We gain experience and we build better tools which make us more productive. So the same human that might have spent uh, six hours finding prey as he learns better and better techniques and builds tools and gains experience, he would be able to do the same job in less time uh, in the next day and then even less time in the third day and so forth. And what happens is some people over time discover that they're learning better and they're becoming better and better at certain things while not experiencing the same improvement in productivity in certain other things. And this might be due to many, many different factors. Maybe someone has a talent or a special interest or skill or learning in one area. And then what happens is this person will gradually gravitate towards doing more of that same activity. So if you feel like you're getting better and better in hunting, you will try to do more hunting and less of the gathering maybe, which uh, in which you haven't found a lot of success. As a result, over time you become a master in your own field by not doing other things and focusing on the same activity over time. 
And to take a deeper look at this, people are driven by economics, even if they have not been trained as economists. So even in a caveman economy, people will gravitate toward things that are more efficient. The way uh, of doing things that is the most efficient will be over time chosen. And here what's happening is um, the people are generating economies of scale. Uh, this is a very interesting and important concept. This is the mother of all efficiencies. You gain efficiencies as you do more of the same thing. Basically, this is defined as economies you gain by increasing the scale of your activity. And the graph on the right is also depicting this, and it shows that as you increase the quantity of one activity, one economic activity, the unit cost of that activity goes down. So a smaller operation has a higher average cost, and larger operation has lower average cost. And the reason this happens is that there are certain fixed costs that are there when you first try to do something, but uh, they can be used for producing a lot more uh, of, of output. In our caveman example, you can think of the hunter that first has to practice a new technique for hunting an animal. And then after many hours of practice, he'd be able to hunt one animal with that time investment. Then uh, for hunting the second animal, he doesn't have to do any of that. He just basically is immediately ready to do it. So one investment pays off for uh, many units of output. As a result, it's just more efficient to keep doing what you have prepared for. Now you may ask, what does this uh, have to do with the caveman economy? So economies of scale would push people to specialize. And as they specialize and learn over time, they become a lot better at doing uh, those same activities. And they end up producing a lot more output than their own consumption. So the person who has been uh, hardly able to produce food for himself now produces uh, three times, four times more than his own personal consumption. And this creates a situation where people have excess extra accumulated capital to uh, f to do something with it basically now imagine um, alice has become a master in gathering berries and bob has become a master in hunting so this situation creates the incentive for making the first exchange and that is how barter is created in this economy so basically now Alice has a lot of cherries and Bob has a lot of meat. And so they have the incentive to exchange these. And in the first barter that would happen, um, Bob will give her some meat and receive some cherries. Now, if the trade is fair, what's being given is comparable to what you receive, right? So then I might ask, why would you even try to exchange two things of comparable value? Um, I mean, if you value them equally, why do you even go through the pain of exchange? And this argument might suggest that exchange uh, is useless, but we intuitively know that it helps both parties. So let's see what happens. Um, Alice would basically think that she values the first bag a lot because that's what she needs to eat this day and her survival depends on that. So it's extremely important. But the second bag is not needed that day. Instead, maybe she can save it for the next day. And then the third bag for the third day, but it's going to be a little bit uh, less uh, uh, edible and nice to eat, right? So Because things start to go bad. And maybe the fourth bag is uh, completely useless because it's going to be uh, all bad by the time she gets to it, right? So she doesn't value all of these bags equally. And basically what happens in a barter situation is that people trade the last unit of their output, which they value the least. And this is the law of marginal utility discovered by Carl Menger, which says people value a, an item or a product less and less as they acquire more units of it. So let's add some numbers to our example and say that Alice values the first bag of cherries 20 units. Very, very important for her, right? And that the second bag, only 10 units, and third one, five units, and the fourth one, only 
one unit, right? So Alice has produced 36 units of value in their own little caveman economy. Bob has also been very active today. He spent the whole day in the forest hunting animals and he values the first piece of meat that he obtained uh, by 20 units and the last one by one unit. So similar to Alice, he has also produced 36 units of value. And this economy overall has 72 units of value generated. So now Alice and Bob each have certain units of their own output that are almost useless to them and worthless. But um, they're stuck with it and they don't know what to do with it, right? So after some, some time, Alice would grow frustrated because she sees that every time she goes gathering, some part of uh, her work gets wasted because she can't eat all that, right? But she also gets bored eating cherries all the time, right? So she would feel that she needs some um, change and she has demand for meat. So now she'll be looking at one of the pieces of meat that Bob has. And in her mind, that piece of meat is very valuable because this is first for her. And she is um, she really needs that first piece of meat, right? So the value that she would place on that is actually 20 units. And uh, comparatively, and that's the same unit that Bob doesn't even care for. And same thing goes in Bob's mind. After eating a lot of meat, he feels like he needs some cherries as well. And then the first bag of cherries that he acquires is extremely valuable. So he would uh, value that by 20 units as well. And this combination allows us to solve the paradox of trade and to see how um, equally valuable items would still be exchanged. And the reason is the owner doesn't value them as much as the buyer would value. So uh, once the trade happens, both parties would have gotten rid of something they don't like and they would receive something they really like. So once the exchange has happened, you can see that now Alice has one piece of meat that she values a lot and uh, her total worth is now 55 units. And same thing is happening to Bob, 55 units. So the economy that previously had 72 units of output or 72 units of value now has 110 units of value. And that's how economy grows. That's what we call economic growth. So now we begin to understand how the combination of specialization and trade grow the economy. And even though in today's economies, uh, you know, we are dealing with a much more complicated thing, still the dynamics are the same. Different parts of the economy and even different countries tend to specialize in certain things and learn a lot about it and, and be able to produce a lot of it. Then they have the need to trade that surplus with some other party. And after that trade happens, um, it's a win-win and both parties now have uh, more value. And the more trade that happens, the larger the economic growth. So if we want a better economy, we would want to encourage people to engage in production and exchange. So anything that uh, facilitates trade is, is a plus. Now, certain conditions must be met in our barter example for the trade to happen. And the first one is that Alice must want the meat, right? And Bob must want the cherry. And this is what economists called double coincidence of wants. And this makes things a bit hard. Like if Bob doesn't really like cherries and he instead wants some grain, then uh, Alice wouldn't be able to trade her cherries with, uh, with meat. So both parties will be out of luck. Bob can't get rid of his surplus and Alice wouldn't get what she wants. So that's a problem. But it doesn't end there. Uh, we have other conditions to meet. And uh, the first one is what I call temporal coincidence. And what it says is basically the two parties that want to exchange must meet at the same time. And uh, to extend that, the products that are being exchanged must also be ready at the time of exchange. 
Uh, for example, if cherry is ready right now, but meat is going to be ready at some time in future, right? So still in that case, uh, trade would uh, run into trouble. Another condition is a spatial coincidence. Alice and Bob must meet in the same place, right? So if they're in two different tribes and uh, they both have a surplus and they are communicating somehow at the same time, still without meeting uh, in the same place, they wouldn't be able to do that exchange. So basically for this trade to happen, uh, you need to have coincidence of wants coincidence of space and coincidence of time. So all of these conditions will limit the number of trades that are uh, that are possible, which basically severely limits the ability uh, to grow this economy. In many cases, there is something available for sale that nobody wants or something will be available at some time in the future that makes trade uh, impossible or things aren't there uh, in the in the place that they need to be. So let's look specifically at the first condition, coincidence of wants. So again, the problem would be that Alice wants to meet, but Bob doesn't like cherries. Maybe he just uh, spoke with uh, his physician, and physician says you have to limit the sugar intake. So basically, Bob would uh, not like cherries. Trade wouldn't happen, and now both parties are upset, and the economy is stagnant. So now imagine something else happens. That tribe grows, and Kathy enters the economy. She is the expert in growing wheat. And uh, basically, she wants to buy cherries now, but unfortunately, Alice doesn't like wheat. She just wants meat. And Bob, however, would like to buy wheat, but Kathy is not much of a carnivore, so she wouldn't want any meat. So again, no trade can happen under these conditions. We need another innovation in this economy, so our cavemen would have to invent something. Now let's say Bob thinks that even though he doesn't need any cherries, but in a casual conversation with Kathy, he realizes that Kathy would like cherries, right? So then Bob would be able to trade meat for cherries um, and then use those cherries to buy some wheat from Kathy. And if this happens, Kathy would get the cherries she wants and uh, Alice would get the meat and Bob will get the wheat, right? So everyone will be happy uh, thanks to Bob's innovation. And this would be the first time this economy created a medium of exchange. Bob acquired cherries only for the purpose of exchanging it later with something else. Uh, and that's uh, uh, that makes cherries a medium of exchange in this case. And because Bob cannot generally sell uh, cherries immediately after he acquired them. He would basically have to wait until he's able to make the second trade. And in that time, cherries would act as a store of value. The, the output that Bob had created for the economy would have to be temporarily st stored in the form of cherries. So thanks to Bob, this economy now has a medium of exchange and a store of value. Now let's see how money and credit are created in this economy. In previous slides, we saw how Bob was able to innovatively use cherries as a medium of exchange to buy wheat, uh, which uh, he wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Other participants would see this and start realizing that cherries actually have some level of saleability, and if they accept it now, maybe in future, they'd be able to find somebody who would take it as payment. So uh, trust in this medium of exchange begins to form. So now more people begin using this product as a medium of exchange, and that in turn has the effect of making that product more saleable. So now more people would actually be willing to accept it, and that makes trade easier for everyone else and makes cherries even a better medium. And this uh, uh, becomes a self-reinforcing cycle where uh, because of higher saleability, even more people would be willing to 
take this uh, product as as payment, and that itself makes it more attractive for future uh, adopters. And that's kind of the game theory behind formation of money and monetization of an asset. As an example, assume a fourth person uh, enters the economy. Uh, Dick is a wool producer, and he personally has no reason to consume cherries and even own it or keep it. But just because every other partner uh, in, in the trade would accept cherries, it would make sense for Dick to also accept it as payment because he knows that in future he will be able to sell it to three other people. And this is how money emerges. So we can now call cherries money, uh, in fact. Money is defined as a good that's accepted not for its consumption value, but for its ability to facilitate trade and be sold for something else later. So basically, the only function that money has to perform is to be sold later for some other valuable good. If cherries were perfectly durable and transportable and had a lot of other properties that we seek in money, um, you would be perfectly fine with this. And the whole economy, and even uh, at a much bigger scale, would be able to run uh, on cherries as money. But obviously, cherries don't uh, last long. So once one of these participants accepts it as, as payment, uh, clock is ticking within a few days he has to find another buyer of that and uh, its value starts uh, diminishing the minute you buy it right so the value you have thought that uh, you've stored in this uh, goes down over time and that's and that's pretty pretty uh, problematic for its use as money so even though Bob was really innovative and smart in using cherries as medium of exchange Ultimately, cherry fails as money, like many other kinds of money that have failed in the past. And failure of money is uh, an economic disaster because it uh, slows down economic growth and hampers trade. So now assume that a fifth producer enters the economy, which is a tool maker, and specifically, he's uh, really skilled at making hammers. And uh, hammer is interestingly very, very desirable for everyone in this economy because all of them need to use some kind of hammer-like tool to produce what they uh, what they want to produce. So now we have arrived at a product in this economy that is universally desired, and uh, this provides a much better and stronger foundation for something uh, becoming money in the future. And unlike cherries, were only, which were only desired by some people in this economy. Now, let's say Alice and Bob both like hammers because they can use it in their own production and daily life, uh, but also they see it has monetary value, so it has it's doubly valuable to them. For Kathy, uh, she doesn't have a direct use for hammers, but she still goes along because other people accept this as money. So she can see that at least whenever she wants to do trade, she would uh, be better off acquiring some hammers. Hammers like cherries would uh, mitigate double coincidence of wants, uh, but they are more desirable and therefore they are more saleable, uh, relatively more liquid, and they're ultimately more, more trustworthy as a medium of exchange compared to cherries. So they're just better money. So our village has arrived at good money for the first time. In this case, assume that uh, Kathy was already begrudgingly going along, and now Dick comes along and he's like, yeah, I'm absolutely not gonna accept this thing as money. For some reason, I don't like to carry hammers. So it's, it's a non-starter. I'll never use this. So at the moment, hammers are a less than ideal form of money. Now, if for some reason, a substantial portion of people in this village decide that um, they don't need hammers, uh, basically double coincidence of wants will, um, will emerge again, and then trade will be hampered. So uh, it is possible that change of desire and demand would 
make uh, money dysfunctional at some point. So for example, if Dick says, um, uh, from now on, I won't accept hammers as money, you know, I've discovered that they are actually of no use and they actually hurt me and my ability to move, um, and it's so heavy, so I won't accept it anymore. And that becomes a problem for hammer as money. But interestingly, in, uh, in a monetization process, you always have competing alternatives. And so now assume that a knife is invented and unlike hammers, which were really attractive for a lot of people, uh, uh, knives are attractive for almost everybody. And, and even Dick would be able to accept it because he has more use for that. So now you, you've got a product that's even more um, universally desirable. Therefore, it's more saleable and, and can function uh, better as money. Now, you can also imagine that, you know, nobody uh, would uh, immediately transition to this new form of money. There is kind of some kind of, uh, you know, skepticism at first. So maybe some people in the village would still try to use hammer for for sale, but they will end up having a harder time convincing maybe Dick and to some extent Kathy to buy the hammer. So it becomes a harder money to trade with. And then over time, other people like Dick and Kathy, who have been more uh, open to using knife, they see that, okay, they can sell it to everyone else pretty easily, more easily than hammers. So over time, they will fare better in trade, they'll be more successful, and more and more people like Bob and Alice will try to transition from the older money to the newer money. And again, this is another part of the game theory where two kinds of money compete, and the one that has higher saleability over time attracts, um, you know, users of the previous money. And uh, ultimately, again, the, the whole village has the incentive to transition and converge on a single form of money. And this largely happens because of a phenomenon called the network effect. And basically what uh, it says is anything that works like a network becomes more valuable as more users use it. And therefore, uh, because it just got more valuable, even more users will be attracted to it. So uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of process creates a situation where if you have competing networks, only one of them will uh, ultimately win and take the whole market share because you basically end up having a gigantic network, which is extremely more valuable and interesting than the smaller networks. So new players don't have a reason to join the smaller networks. Everyone fares better if they are on the same network. Ultimately, we will see that more and more hammer users will switch to knife and knife becomes the de facto money of the village and uh, hammer becomes demonetized and goes back to being a regular commodity that's just bought for uh, consumption and its own use. From this point on, everyone in this village has to have knives for trade. Uh, otherwise, other people would refuse uh, to trade with them. Everyone wants knives because everyone else wants it. As a result, there's a huge demand for knives and everyone starts pricing their goods and services in knives. And that's what we call a unit of account. Now, all the economic activity that's available for trade will uh, have a price uh, in the number of knives. So basically knife becomes not only a medium of exchange, not only a store of value, but now a unit of account. Now let's see how money and credit are created in this economy. So we previously also talked about t the issue of temporal coincidence that must be solved for economic exchange to happen. And basically uh, this, uh, stipulates that the two parties that are exchanging should basically have uh, the goods uh, that are exchanged uh, available at the same time. In a barter example, if you're exchanging wheat with cherries, um, you know, both products should be ready right there. 
Um, and but in, in in practice, you will see that wheat will be available next season, cherry right now. So you don't have temporal matching between these two products. Even if you have money and you want to use money as uh, uh, as payment, basically, then your money must be available right there. And and, and if your money has a strong physical footprint, then uh, that's a challenge you need to solve. And you need to have the money available exactly at the time you want to make the trade. But sometimes money is not available, like wheat were, was not available at the um, at the right season. So now assume that Bob wants to sell some meat and buy wheat from Kathy. Uh, unfortunately, wheat is not available. So Bob basically can sell the meat and... Uh, because they are in the same tribe and he has uh, some kind of uh, acquaintance and friendship with Kathy, he would basically trust her and say, okay, I'll, I'll give my product to you now and you pay me back in wheat later. Uh, or if it's, if it's a, a transaction uh, based on money, he could send the product first and then, um, you know, have a social contract to receive knives later on. And this is basically how credit is invented, uh, which is basically a promise of future payment in whatever form that's agreed upon, physical products or money itself. An invention of credit solves the temporal coincidence problem for us. So now Bob has to remember to ask for the wheat in future from Kathy. And if it's one or two people, maybe Bob can remember this for some time. But if you are interacting with a lot of people in a big society, keeping track of all those promises can be uh, can quickly become impossible. And and it's basically not socially scalable. Um, therefore, we have to invent some kind of a better promise system. Now, the knives that we invented previously as money also can act as credit tokens because they have a very interesting property just by by their sheer physical presence they can uh, act as uh, you know proof of future payment so instead of bob remembering to ask for the wheat if only bob has the knife itself in the physical form it's proof that he has previously provided some value to someone in this economy that might have been kathy or not and then other people would uh, accept uh, that knife uh, and, and and exchange it with some other useful product so this is where the uh, borderline between money and credit gets fuzzy and money can actually act as a promise of future trade. So in other words, delayed transaction um, token and a store of value across time. So you store the output of your labor into the money and in future it allows you to make other trades with it and other people will uh, trade with you based on it. So. Uh, the physical aspect of money, the durability of it, will allow it to work as a promise system also. So in fact, money and credit are both just promises for future trades and delayed transactions. However, one important feature here is non-physical forms of credit have an advantage that they don't rely on all the limitations that physical commodities have. Uh, obviously, if something has a physical form, that form might get damaged or altered, or even transporting things across uh, space um, could have some kind of cost depending on how heavy or how difficult to move it is. But credit, if it is uh, just a, a remembered promise or if it's a piece of paper or the kind of an agreement between two parties uh, takes away that physicality and with that removes the constraints uh, of transportation and upkeep and all and as we said earlier we have a third problem to solve which is a spatial coincidence and basically what it says is 
uh, traders must, must meet at a place to exchange. Uh, previously, everyone had to meet physically and physically exchange commodities and money. And uh, since we have digital technologies, we can meet in cyberspace. Uh, and that's why uh, basically marketplace was invented. And, and now we have either physical or digital marketplaces and platforms. In a physical marketplace where money is physical, uh, the portability, portability of it also becomes really important. You have to carry the money with you to be able to do the trade. So um, if your money is heavy, if it's hard to transport, and if it's costly to do so, uh, it's just not going to work as well uh, as money. And this is where physical commodities um, are at a disadvantage. And for example, uh, if you wanted to trade with gold, you'd have to transfer the gold across country borders, and that would obviously be something dangerous and expensive. So uh, people naturally gravitated to lighter forms of credit, uh, and basically two traders would agree with each other uh, uh, and maybe write it on a piece of paper that, hey, you owe me this much or I owe you that much. And, and basically come fully avoid exchanging uh, the gold. And after some, some trades, all of those accumulated papers, which is just the balance of all the promises, uh, would be finally settled in gold only once. So at the time where we were stuck with physical forms of money, uh, credit came in as a way to replace the physicality with trust. So now uh, money was just a piece of paper and it was only as good as uh, the trust you have in the other party to fulfill uh, their promise. Now let's see what makes for good money. So this discussion basically allows us to understand what money does and uh, what kind of features it needs to perform its function. First of all, we observed that money must be something that's in heavy demand. Many people like it, therefore it's very, very saleable and liquid. Money should also be durable. Over time, it shouldn't lose its value. Money should be portable as well. Across a space, uh, it shouldn't lose value. Uh, it must be highly divisible uh, because you know the, the size of the trade varies uh, significantly. So your money should be able to handle small and large trades. And if you receive a big payment for a big trade, you should be able to uh, divide it into smaller pieces for smaller trades. So anything that's not easily divisible also would be an inferior form of money. Um, on top of that, money should be kind of dense in value, which goes hand in hand with portability. Value per unit of weight should be high because um, you need to sometimes perform really high value trades and you don't really wanna carry uh, loads of money with you to perform that trade. So it should be dense in value. Money should also be verifiable, meaning if you receive something that looks like a knife, you have to be able to quickly tell that if it's a legit knife or if it's a fake one. If it's fake, the danger is other people later would not accept it from you. So uh, it wouldn't work for you if you if you get duped into accepting it. So uh, certain things are easier to verify, certain things are harder. So that's, that's also another uh, important feature. And money should be fungible as well, meaning two units of money should not be different from one another. For example, if you're exchanging different rocks as money, each kind of rock is is different from the other one, and maybe they have different value, and uh, that makes it very, very hard to trade with rocks. Or if, for example, you're using knives and each knife is built a little bit differently, a bit different size, different material, then it becomes a nightmare to value each of these knives and see how much commodity each can buy. What if we have a rule, we agree on a rule that all knives must be made in a, in a standard way 
and uh, each knife is just as good as the other knife. That's uh, what we call fungibility. And that significantly facilitates trades. A final feature of money is related to scarcity, but before we understand it, we have to evaluate the money supply. Let's assume that just for the sake of this example, we value for the four commodities that we've talked about equally. So one bag of cherry is uh, valued the same as a, a piece of meat or, or wheat or uh, sheep, right? So uh, now assume that we have three units of each of these items. And ultimately we have 12 units uh, that, are, that have equal value uh, in the market. And now assume that we've just invented knives uh, and the supply is very limited. We have six of, six of them available. So in this case, uh, if we want to represent the wealth of the village in knives and basically use knives as the unit of account, uh, 12 units of value, 12 units um, of commodities would have to convert and be equal to these six knives. As a result, each knife will be equal to two units of those commodities. In other words, a bag of cherries would be priced at half a knife. Two bags will be one full knife and so forth. This is how the value and the purchasing power of money is determined. It's important to realize that prices emerge in a process of negotiation and interaction among market participants. So if seller of the cherry suddenly wants to say, oh, actually my cherries, a bag of cherry is not worth half a knife. It, in fact, I want to sell it for one knife. Other people just won't accept that price. And uh, then he either has to refrain from selling and fail in the market or reduce the price until somebody else is willing to pay uh, uh, that, uh, that much knife for, uh, for for purchase. Now, what if all these commodity producers uh, come out and say, oh, actually our products are worth double now, and they all agree on that, right? So would that work? It wouldn't because, you know, doubling the price has the effect of doubling the demand for money, and therefore, if there aren't 12 knives in this economy, uh, people can't price uh, their each unit of good equal to one knife. So, so to understand mechanically what exactly happens here, let's price all the goods uh, double. So to buy all of these goods, you need 12 knives. However, in, in all of the economy altogether, we only have six knives. So the first six knives would go to the market and be able to buy half of the wealth that is uh, created. In other words, half of the goods that are available for trade will be bought. The next half uh, would not be bought. No one has any more money to buy these. So naturally, uh, people would understand that we have overpriced things. And if we want to sell them, we'd have to reduce the price. So ultimately, everything will adjust such that the total value available for trade, uh, and, and roughly speaking, the total wealth should equal the total amount of money. Now you might ask, what if the supply of money changes and our toolmaker produces more units of knife? So now in this case, I have doubled the amount to 12 knives. If commodity producers want to stick with previous prices, they will quickly see that the first six knives will buy up all the commodity and there would still be six more knives available in the hands of other market participants and no goods available. So suddenly the value of a knife plummets because it can buy nothing and the value of goods uh, go through the roof because uh, we are facing extreme shortage. So people might be willing to pay a lot of knives for just a little bit of a an additional um, uh, uh, good, right? So if you miss price, market will ultimately force you to match these prices. And, and you will see that over time, um, uh, pri uh, as the money supply doubles, 
all prices will also double to match this change. And um, ultimately, you've created no value in this economy by doubling the amount of money. You have just uh, changed the accounting system to um, equate one bag of cherries with one whole knife now instead of half a knife previously. Even though no new wealth is created by playing with the money this way, but if the new units of money are distributed uh, in equally, you will see a shift of wealth. So if our toolmaker just made six more units of knife, uh, he will basically be able to buy up everything in that village and he will be very, very rich. And everybody else who were holding the previous units of knife will uh, end up having nothing. Now, all the existing holders of money that can't buy anything on the market, they have to just bid up the prices. And as soon as a little bit of product shows up, they have to pay exorbitant prices for that, which means the purchasing power of their money goes down and the price of everything goes up. To summarize, an increase in the supply of money leads to inflation. So this takes us to the Cantillon effect, which was a phenomenon first discovered by Richard Cantillon, an 18th century economist. He discovered that when new money is created and inflation is observed, uh, it's not distributed equally among all participants and all uh, parts of the society. It all depends on where the money flows after it's being created. And as we will see, understanding these flows are extremely helpful in explaining the winners and losers of inflation. Cantillon explained that the effect of money creation depends really on where the money goes after it's created. Uh, and basically he finds that whoever gets the new money first benefits the most and people who get the money late uh, basically lose. The pattern we generally see is that new money is first given to rich people because they control the um, financial institutions. Then it finds its way through the poorer parts of the society. And uh, Cantillon explains that when the rich receive this new money, they get to spend it. Once they spend it, um, they go to the market basically and benefit from low prices and they uh, buy anything they like. After this process uh, happens, prices go up. And the person, the poorer parts of the society that receive the money next, now they have to deal with higher prices. Therefore, uh, in effect, less of that new money actually ends up in their hands. And um, they, they have less purchasing power. And this is what we see all the time in modern economies. Since we have completely delinked money from a sound base and uh, moved on to the fiat era, central banks can constantly print new money anytime they like it. For example, when they feel the economy is, uh, is a slow and uh, they want to boost GDP numbers and make things look nicer, they will uh, create new money. And this new money is not distributed usually to ordinary people. Instead, it gets into the hands of uh, banks and government, for example, when the Federal Reserve buys mortgage-backed securities or government treasuries, this money finds itself into the financial markets and institutions are the first ones who get it. And then they get to invest it and generate returns. Uh, as a result, investors and asset owners are the first people who benefit from the new money. And this goes to show why the people who are in charge of the economy really love money printing. And uh, they have uh, supported uh, economic theories that advocate creation of new money at the expense of other schools of thought. Uh, this system really works well. Why, why break it? Uh, you, once you have a lot of assets, uh, you will constantly get richer and richer without doing nothing. You just sit on your assets and wait for the central banks to print money. Ordinary people, on the other hand, only get uh, the effect of this money when uh, inflation picks up and 
bargaining in the labor market causes the wages to go up so people see that okay looks like there's higher demand for there's higher employment higher demand for the labor wages go up but that's only playing catch up with the inflation a great example of this happened recently in the aftermath of the covid pandemic as all the market sold off and credit dried up and bond market broke federal reserve panicked and they launched a new quantitative easing program from march 2020 to march 2022 they have injected upward of four and a half trillions of dollars into the economy and most of it has gone to mortgage-backed securities and government treasuries so in the recessionary environment you expect uh, banks and uh, other institutions to be a lot more careful and cautious in lending to people but because we had federal reserve buying all of these uh, mortgage-backed securities the rates uh, in the housing market was artificially kept low and it caused um, a lot of activity in this market investors particularly those that were able to access low rates rushed to the market and tried to buy up anything and everything they could find and of course this all led to an unprecedented rise in the housing prices from the chart you can see that in the uh, two years that uh, the quantitative e easing program was in progress the median price of a house went up from three hundred and twenty thousand dollars to four hundred and eight thousand which is uh, about a 33 percent increase um, basically uh, with no fundamental driver it wasn't like we suddenly had a lot of uh, a lot of immigration or population went up or wages went up um, none of that even though they might have varied a little bit but none of these factors explain the 30 percent jump in housing prices in such short uh, time frame and in what was the classic Cantillon effect unfolding before our eyes Wall Street rushed to the market and tried to buy up all the housing and these deep pocketed investors uh, competed with the ordinary person trying to buy the house primarily for personal consumption any new house that would come on the market for sale was quickly snatched by these players uh, who offered uh, cash and better prices and of course these investors were not crazy they knew that the more houses they are able to buy the more loan they can get the interest on the loan would be um, grossly lower than the expected appreciation rate of the property here's a great report by slate in june 21 they found that invitation homes which was a spin-off of blackstone the world's largest private equity company was able to buy a significant number of houses in the Atlanta area they found that while ordinary people would receive mortgage interest rates between two to four percent invitation homes could borrow for a lot less actually 1.4 percent which gave them an advantage in bidding up the prices and being able to uh, pay more pay in cash pay easily while still technically costing them the same as a result the average retail buyer would not be able to buy would have a really hard time finding new homes and uh, would eventually be priced out so in effect the actions of the federal reserve has created a monopoly and a risk-free return business for these companies and this is what happens in all hard assets when uh, there is basically no new production coming online and productivity doesn't necessarily go up but money supply uh, is, is suddenly uh, increased uh, by a significant amount now let's see what happens if we all become more productive the economy grows and we are able to produce a lot more products and the supply of goods go up if the supply of money stays uh, the same you will end up in a situation where the same amount of a knife can now buy a lot more product so over time you get another adjustment where now each unit of product is worth half a knife so um, again the, the same the, the stable rule in all of these uh, 
changes is that the total value that's created is equal to the total money that's available. And if you have real economic growth and you don't mess with money, things get cheaper and cheaper over time. And that's what we call deflation, which can be a representation of economic growth. In fact, in a natural economy where nobody is messing uh, with the supply of money, we expect deflation to be the norm, not inflation. So hopefully this discussion makes it very clear that supply of money is of significant consequence for money holders. If you are uh, if you are agreeing to use knives as money, and overnight somebody doubles the supply of money, and and uh, creates a lot of it for themselves. So your wealth is cut in half and shifted to that person. In other words, they stole your wealth. So uh, the best form of money is one whose supply cannot be changed and is highly, highly credible. And uh, that's one of the main reasons uh, gold was selected as, uh, as the best form of money previously because it was extremely hard to mine new gold, whereas it wasn't really hard to mine new silver or copper or other commodities. And that takes us to the concept of stock to flow. The stock to flow is basically the ratio between the existing stock of a commodity to flow of new production in every year. And, and basically what you're trying to do is comparing how much uh, the supply is expanding compared to the total amount of that commodity that's available. In effect, this could be thought of as an inverse uh, inflation index. If a commodity has high stock to flow ratio, it means that the, uh, the, the new supply that comes online every year is very small compared to the total, total amount of that commodity. In other words, this commodity suffers from a small level of inflation. As a result, uh, it will hold its value better and would be a, a stronger store of value. Here you can see a numerical comparison of stock to flow for several assets. Uh, for example, gold stock to flow is 65, silver is uh, 20, uh, crude, copper, corn, wheat, these are super low. Uh, and, and the reason for that is they uh, every year a lot more of these commodities come online compared to the stock of it stock of available amount of that commodity but gold um, has kept its monetary status primarily because of its high stock to flow ratio and here you can see a comparison between gold and bitcoin uh, in the first uh, few cycles of bitcoin the inflation rate was was high therefore stock to flow ratio was a lot uh, lower at the moment, in the current cycle, Bitcoin's inflation rate is 1.77, which is roughly equal to gold. And in the next cycle, Bitcoin's uh, stock to flow will, will surpass gold. And in the next cycle, the inflation rate will be roughly cut by half and another half in the next cycle. Although it's not going to be exactly half because we know the supply of new Bitcoin will be cut by half, but, but uh, the total supply would constantly increase. So um, uh, it actually would be better than half. And to make things even better, this is algorithmic. This is not going to be impacted by price. If price of gold suddenly goes up by a factor of five, you will see that the supply uh, will increase and all the miners will try to mine more gold. But this is not going to happen with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin benefits from an extremely credible and mathematically certain supply schedule. The problem with using knives as money is that its supply is actually not credible. Anyone with some level of skills would be able to create new knives and over time will, people will actually learn that this is a profitable thing to do and they will engage in producing more and more knives. Or if you have an organization or a person in charge of managing money, they will find all the reasons in the world to inflate the supply. Because this is a really simple and effective way to enrich yourself at the expense of everybody else in the society. So it's important to realize that if the supply of money can be increased, it will eventually be increased. And 
Uh, the effect of that would be rampant inflation and loss of trust in that money as people realize that this money is actually losing purchasing power and its supply is inflating and there is uh, there are uh, there are people who are extracting monetary energy from uh, holders of this money they will start to say okay this money apparently isn't working as I thought so they would refuse to accept it trust will go down and everything we said that uh, helps uh, money emerge as something that's trustworthy and saleable would unwind and get reversed. And this is how uh, inflation and hyperinflation kills money. Now, if we accept the fact that if humans can inflate the supply of money, they will, then the only way to achieve credible supply is to use some sort of commodity as money whose supply cannot be increased or increasing supply is very very difficult so most commodities in the world do not have an absolute scarcity so there's ample amount of uh, uh, commodities in the world but some of them are really hard to mine like gold and that's why uh, gold has become a, a really good form of money uh, because it's just impossible to quickly uh, produce a lot of it. However, it's important to realize that this is also a relative argument. And if tomorrow the uh, price of gold uh, goes up by a factor of 10, you will definitely see gold miners doing all they can to increase the supply, ramping up mining operations, trying to find previously unprofitable sources of gold to mine, and so forth. So. Basically, inflation of supply is something we can minimize, but we can't get rid of. But if we had a way to mathematically and certainly guarantee supply of something wouldn't change, that would be the perfect form of money from the supply credibility and scarcity standpoint. While in the physical world, finding absolute scarcity is very difficult, we can engineer a system that uh, mathematically guarantees scarcity. And that's exactly what Satoshi Nakamoto invented with Bitcoin. And if one thing is true for sure in our monetary system, it's inflation and the constant loss of purchasing power of the dollar. And this chart shows a century of dollars history. For example, you can see that since the uh, passage of the Federal Reserve Act and creation of the central bank, dollar's value has constantly gone down. Uh, many things have happened in the meantime, but uh, the trend you can count on is the debasement of the dollar. And it's in this context that Friedrich Hayek writes in the denationalization of money. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that history is largely a history of inflation, usually inflations engineered by governments for the gain of governments. So that wraps up this section about what money is, what function it performs, and what we can call good money. So tune in for our next courses. In the next course, immediately after this one, we will talk about historical evolution of money from, uh, from uh, high demand goods to collectibles to metals and coins and fiat and Bitcoin. In the uh, following course, we will talk about fiat specifically and the history of US monetary policy, including uh, different uh, events that happened in the last century, the actions of the central banks, different recessions and monetary agreements, the uh, emergence of euro dollar, uh, petro dollar, the dot com bubble, the 2008 crisis, the quantitative easing programs and quantitative tightening, and ultimately the COVID pandemic and the monetary response to it. We will have another course that covers different macroeconomic theories and various schools of thought. Uh, this is especially important because uh, these uh, ideas form the foundation of the actions of uh, governments, uh, central banks, and financial institutions. Lastly, we will talk specifically about Bitcoin economics and try to understand its role as money and the bedrock of the financial system in a world that runs on the Bitcoin standard. If you liked our content and think other people would benefit from accessing it, please help us spread the word. Follow us online and please share our content with your friends and followers. 
For example, if you're on Twitter, we would love for you guys to share your feedback with us. Send a tweet, tag our account, BigGuide underline IO, and tell us what you think about the course and uh, what content would you like uh, BigGuide to produce next. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'll see you in the next course.